Welcome to Small Talk with Raincraft. I'm Subha, a leadership and executive coach. And I'm Hasita. I'm a marketing strategist. We're just two people who love to talk and love to learn. And this is us being curious about the world around us. Join us. Hey there, small talkers. Welcome to today's episode. I'll be speaking to Shrideep Keshavan, the CEO of Heritage Foods. Shrideep has had a stellar career across global brands and across geographies. He has been with Coca-Cola, managing some of their top brands like Maza, Minute Maid, and more. He's also worked at Olam International with a stint at Gabon in Africa. What I love about Shrideep is that he brings a wealth of knowledge in managing people, businesses, turning around businesses, and of course, his real true love, marketing. So let's hear what Shridip has to say, shall we? Hi Shridip, welcome to Small Talk. So happy to have you here. Thank you, Subha. Very, very nice to be here. I was wondering why it was taking us time to connect and I realize now that you've been waiting for World Milk Day. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so, I was thinking back on uh, our time at uh, XLRI and I realized early on in business school, you were pretty sure that you wanted to be a marketer, right? Yes. Actually, I should say that I didn't have that clarity before I joined the B school. But I guess in the first uh, trimester itself, it was very clear to me exactly what I wanted to do. Because I had the sense of idea of building businesses and leading them. And you always have multiple functions in doing that. And you fall in love with what vibes with you the most, right? And that happened to be marketing. Interesting. Because I, I do remember that it was something that really excited. And I'm happy to see that it continues to excite you. Right? I think marketing is really where you've had really beautiful stints over the last so many years across large brands, across geographies. What do you remember as now maybe your most memorable moment in marketing, if I can put it that way? Right. So the reason why I love marketing and I think I continue to love marketing and it forms a big part of my work, day-to-day work as well, is because of the inexplicable conundrum called human being actually at the center of it. It's it's so difficult and, and it's actually the thrill and challenge of managing human potential which actually drew me into business management itself. I'm an engineer by training otherwise and I worked for a long time before I realized that no, this is not what I want to do. I really want to work with people and people, managing teams and people can be really uh, difficult. And within the business functions. There are just two functions which are obsessed with people and one happens to be the human resource function and the other is a marketer who is concerned or rather obsessed with human beings in the form of consumers. And all my high points in marketing have been about discovering that surprising element in in human behavior, thinking, attitudes, etc., breaking uh, existing molds of thinking, existing conceptions. Early on in marketing, I used to spend a lot of time meeting up with consumers, spending a lot of time sitting at their homes, their workplaces, their colleges, chatting with them about life, about why they do what they do, and not being obsessed with our brands or our products, but generally wanting to understand their life. And uh, the insights that I've got in those conversations are probably the most, uh, the biggest highlights, uh, the most cherished moments for me as a marketer. That's lovely. I think your work could have taken you to a lot of maybe small towns, uh, retailers, distributors, and just really to meet the folks on the ground, right? Selling your product and why they do it. Why, why do they even have that connect with you guys? Yeah, so, uh, you know, one of the biggest insights I've had is spoken with consumers, I can say at least in three continents. <laughs> and as part of a project, I did extensive consumer studies in, in the U.S. That took me across the country in the U.S., speaking with many consumers, understanding their behavior, their attitudes. In India, I did my extensive uh, consumer research, speaking with consumers, understanding the motivations. In, like you said, 
in small towns and metro cities all kinds of consumers one fundamental truth that i learned in all of these conversations is that the human being at the end of the day is all the same it's all if you drill down to the first principle you know you you ask why they do this probably three or four or five times you come to the core motivations and the core motivations of uh, human beings in most situations across all these settings uh, is similar quite similar as a, in fact in many cases it's even same that that's a very big re- revelation as far as a marketer is concerned because a lot of people love to dissect and like you know do segmentations and like say that, okay this guy is like this that guy is like this but that's that's quite a superficial level of uh, work and if you dig deep actually you hit probably the same motivation across segments it's both a revelation as well as a challenge it's obvious why it is a revelation but as a challenge the biggest challenge you have when you do something like that is that oh now everybody is the same what do i do with this insight <laughs> how do i talk meaningfully to this person and you've uh, worked with uh, coca cola for so many years such a i mean one of the most loved brands globally so being in a marketing function in such a well known brand does that make it easier or tougher you know both from a marketing sense and even just in terms of bringing on talent Okay, let me address the second question. That's uh, you know for bringing on talent. It's it's such a big brand. It's such a reputed, such a respectable organization that you know attracting talent is never a problem. Everybody wants to have that tag on them, right? You know, work with X Coke or Coke or whatever it is. So attracting talent is the easier part. But working at Coke is is, is a mixed bag. It's it's both easy as well as tough. It's easy because you are you have you can lean back on such strong systems and and knowledge and experience that have been gathered over hundred plus years. The the marketing structures and the marketing models are so strong and evolving. And it's not like you know Coca Cola is that again. During my stint at Coca Cola over two decades, we have seen at least uh, three different models of marketing to consumers effectively. So you know it's a company that's constantly reinventing itself. It's a very strong system and it has a very strong marketing process. which makes it easy for you as a marketer because you know you're always guided you have a support system but it is also tough because you're dealing with like huge legacy brands which are larger than life which are so much bigger than you and this brand has been in existence for so many years and will continue to exist for hundreds of years and you are probably giving it a small deflection probably trying to make a very minor change or a, or a impact to the journey that the band is having so it's tough but also i think it's an experience that brings a humility in you in terms of as a marketer you feel so humble like what you do is not so important at the end of the day i liked what you were saying that finally the insight that you gathered is that every consumer is fundamentally the same what about every employee I mean having worked in India having uh, I'm sure interacted with so many teams in the US having worked in Africa is the employee fundamentally the same everywhere uh yeah uh, because uh, at the end of the day the employee is a human being right and and there are still and this is one of the biggest challenges I've had as a leader whether it was a leader of a small team or a division function or or, or an organization that employees and and this is very basic when i say this is because you know uh, you might be wondering but when i say employees beg to be treated as human beings <laughs> that that's so true because if that was not true then the engagement surveys that you would do wouldn't ask questions like on work life balance about being treated with respect because in most of if our organization does uh, engagement survey and sorts uh, you will figure out that the reason why our engagement is poor is because our employees are not treated with respect or our diversity is not encouraged whereas if you look around you in this world the world is full of diversity the fundamental reason why organizations or teams struggle is because we fail to treat them as human beings so yes the answer is very simple you're right i think in our journey as leaders or as becoming leaders and people managers we start discovering that it's the basics that you have to get right respect diversity uh us being authentic in terms of how we we come to work every day but you've also been in uh, over the years quite a few if i could call it challenging turnaround situations that i'm sure requires a different level of leadership if i may it's not about running a good business and 
something that's chugging along and taking it to the next level. But turnaround must be a completely different ball game, people wise. What was your strategy generally? Mustafa, that's thanks for asking that. It's quite a I don't know why, but I have repeatedly found myself to be in situations of turnarounds or rebuilding businesses, etc. I've I've not had any stint where uh, I was expected to manage status quo or or to incremental changes, you know. So I've I've, I've never worked in a situation. It's it's quite by chance, accident, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I've never had this opportunity to do incremental or managing status quo. Yes, the toughest thing in all of this uh, is the people, right? Who's at the middle is the center of it. Of course, yeah, there are other things like, for example, business strategy. When I say business strategy, a competitive position in the market creating understanding what could possibly win you the business etc etc all those things are highly important but at the end of the day all of these things are also done by people right and in organizations you rarely do anything alone the top in my experience and i and this is purely my experience and different people might have different in all the situations where i had such challenging experiences i've always also had to build my own team that's again by chance accident whatever you want to call it it's either because the early team moved on we had to make some changes etc cetera, etc cetera. and that is a big advantage so i wouldn't be able to tell you situations where like another you know, business is suffering and i saddled with people who are demotivated and i had to move them around i haven't had such experiences so in almost all the cases i've had to build my own team but that again that again is difficult it's not so easy because you you have to attract talent into a business that at this point in time is not like the most sought after so that it has its own challenges how do you walk into these like you said it came by chance or it just happened to be the business necessity there's a turnaround required or there's some kind of firefighting to be done how do you walk into it what's your advice for somebody who's in such a situation where they've been told hey fix this it's not working and you're new you're new at the seat do you just kind of roll up your sleeves and start making changes immediately or sometimes you don't have the time to kind of just sit and first figure out or learn or observe and you just have to get going and that can ruffle a lot of feathers too right when when you come in as the new guy and you say hey do this do that change this change that what's worked for you yeah that's, that's such an awesome question especially my current role now i've moved into this organization which has existed for 30 years so it's a large organization right it's a 6000 odd people working so it, it's not like things have not gone all wrong the biggest mistake that people do whenever they walk into situations like the ones that we're discussing is that people often have the habit of saying that oh listen i'm mr fix it and and whatever has been happening here is all like completely uh, screwed up it could have been it, all these things could be much better i'm going to show you how that's the biggest mistake any leader can do because if it was so then this brand or this organization or this department or this function could not have been successful all this while right so hundreds of things must have gone right the people must have delivered par excellence to 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 bring the business to where it is today i would say my approach if if i can say is that in all the situations not barring one i've kind of pushed myself in that situation right in the sense like you know i've pushed myself out of my comfort zone so i've never i don't think that whether it was the role i did as country head in africa or taking up uh, uh, the juice business and at coca cola or or the current role as uh, heading the dairy business the package i've these are not stuff that i've done before so mm-hmm. for me it was like uh, i don't know how to do this <laughs> i'm going to i'm going to learn how to do this i got to figure out and so i'm not walking in with point of view that okay fine say so i'm going to show you how rather i'm i'm going to my approach is we'll figure it out if there is a way to figure it out uh, we'll do it and i think this is also the biggest leadership challenge right as in the situations like these arise because all organizations uh, expect leaders to deliver two things for the organization the first is a performance that's that's much better than similar organizations or competitions people often confuse that with performing against targets and that's not enough because you know in most cases like and if i can talk about the juice business business at coca cola it was not that the juice business was not doing great but it was not doing great in relation to the market around 
as in it had probably lost sight of where the consumer was going where the industry was trending and we were on our track and going somewhere else you know situations are very similar in all the cases so it's performance relative to competition or organizations in similar context and the second is organizations expect the leadership to build potential to perform better than others in the long term so it's not just enough that you perform in the perform better than competition but also build the potential to perform better than others in the long term and in this uh, particular context i can uh, specifically talk about the experience that i've had it's not that the organizations or businesses did not perform till then but it's just that it had lost track or lost out relative to the the, the organizations or competition around them and when you approach it like that and when you approach it with humility saying that okay fine you guys have been doing a wonderful job but it's just that like you know we've slipped behind versus the rest now how do we put this together back so the first thing that you look for is what are the inherent strengths in the organization you're not looking at what is lacking but you're thinking okay so okay so what's going right here so that's that's the first question that i ask always whenever i get into it. okay what has been going right you know something has gone right for us to get here what is that if you approach it like that i think that brings a lot of comfort to the people who are all there in the organization so you're not nobody is coming out and saying that okay fine guys more up who said you haven't done a good job i'm going to teach you how it's not you're saying okay you guys have done a wonderful job till now so what is work for you okay so this is what so you know what your strengths are and then build further on on top of that i think it's an awesome insight for anybody leading teams and walking into a new role or a new project to say hey what's going right i think uh, we uh, very rarely approach it that way we are always ready to solve problems to fix other people's mistakes to to kind of close the loop on things uh, i think this is a wonderful way to look at it say can i walk in and say what's going right and build from there and and it gives such a positive vibe to to everyone involved that you you're here to to elevate us but through our strengths yes and i can give an analogy from the marketing terminology and if i can say for example if you are turning around a brand one thing a marketer should never do is if it's a brand that has been in existence for some time and has had some success in the past i'm 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 not i'm not talking about brand new brands i'm talking about brands which have been around for some time and which needs a facelift one thing that the marketer should never do is fiddle around with the brand essence the brand essence is at the core of uh, the brand it's a seed of the brand and it's the same it's probably the best analogy to what happens in an organization you need to really figure out what is the organization's essence why does it succeed or why has it succeeded and if you can figure out that essence i don't think that you should play around with it if, especially if it has been an organization that has existed for a long yeah i never really thought of it that way that if it's still around then so much is going right and a large part of it is what that brand is already speaking to consumers what it's already saying and somewhere it's there in their in their hearts and minds is something and don't don't tinker with that don't <laughs> don't rock the boat unnecessarily that's a good one and what i'm hearing from you shridip is the kind of leadership roles that you've been in and the kind of strategies that it would have required of you not everything is really if i can say learned on the job right we can't always afford to really say okay let's figure it out as we go along and i realize that you do consume a lot of if i can call it just content i think you i, I do feel like there's a lot of effort that quietly goes be, behind all of this so what's all what's lying underneath the or what's the, you know we're seeing the tip of the iceberg what's below it Oh yes every conversation is a lesson right and uh, everything you you need to be the one thing you will realize and you know when when I compare myself with others who I admire I'm like you know I realize how little I know and I, how small I am but when you look around and observe other people who have done great things you realize that if there is one thing that stands out for them is that they're constantly learning constantly every single day every single moment and every single conversation every single opportunity is an opportunity to learn great leader and a not so great leader and just uh, give an example like you know you have uh, people all, always talk about 
tough conversations at work etc right and the toughest conversations are the conversations that you have with people who are not performing so great and you walk into the conversation wanting to make a difference to the person but i can tell you with guarantee that the biggest change that happens will be in you only if you could reflect on it immediately after the conversation rarely do people do that so you get into a tough uh, performance conversation with someone the difference between great and not so great you know, the others <laughs> probably walk away from the conversation conversation feeling that oh okay i did it to him or whatever but i <laughs> but greatness comes from walking away from the conversation and sitting down and reflecting like what happened there and why did it go that way or what could have been better do you think that you delivered on as an if if the conversation was so great then next moment onwards the performance should actually go zoom but but that's not always the case so a great leader always reflects on his own actions so it's like a constantly looking at the mirror and constantly making notes of what could have been or how it could have been etc so that's that's one so learning from situations and learning from conversations the second thing is of course like you said a learning from content around you because these days there's so much like you know you're currently creating one uh, there's so much so much content out there but the most important thing is for you to understand what really works for you because there's no point in listening to hundreds of thousands of things and or reading up uh, all the books in the world there's so many conflicting points of view out there it's not that conflicting points of view are bad because if if it makes you think it's fine good enough if it challenges your thinking it is great but i think that one needs to make a choice in terms of what really helps you so from that point of view i think one of the podcasts that has helped me a lot is uh, the knowledge project by shane parish i i listen to it a lot and that's one podcast i i listen to all the time but it's not just podcasts right I mean, it's also the books and it's even movies some of the leadership fundamental lessons that i use even today have uh, are things that i've picked up from movies so okay now you have to tell me one or two <laughs> <laughs> i always believe that a leader is a a good leader is a combination of a great visionary and a coach there's this uh, awesome movie called the miracle it's about the 1980 olympics uh, ice hockey team of us it's a real life uh, story about a man called herb brooks he's the coach of the team and in 1978 us was probably i think uh, not in the top 10 teams in the world and would get trashed by anyone <laughs> you know any any team in the world and uh, her brooks was uh, picked up by the hockey association uh, as a coach and see there's a fundamental lesson in that movie and that's always stuck with me so he sits in uh, uh, so he organizes these two days of uh, team selection that so he's picking up his team you know so all the star players and all come and and of course you can imagine a coach picking up a team and everybody has got recommendations like you know there are political recommendations or right? people are all putting in names and actually like all around him people are making the team for him her brooks sits in the selection and uh, the player there are players who come and play for a certain time and they keep going and it happens over two two days but in just uh, one session itself he picked up a p picked a uh, team and he walked out so, and people were stunned <laughs> so so, <laughs> so the, like you were told that you know you haven't even seen the stars and you've just picked up a team just like that so he said that i'm not looking for stars i'm looking for the right ones so you can't build a team of stars you can't pick up the so so this uh, fictitious thing of like cricket there is this, like green 11 and all of that like they pick up tendulkar and vivian richards and couple them and you put them together i'm sure that it's not going to work so that's that's an awesome lesson that i learned from that movie which i practice even till today so when i have a chance to pick my team and um, i'm always looking for people who fit in together who come together to create greatness so it's always the 1 plus 1 equals to 11 that we need from a team it's not like 5 plus 5 that makes it one like so big stars coming in with egos and conflicts 
I want I have to catch this uh, movie and it's reminding me of uh, one of my favorites of late which is the Ted Lasso series the coach that is willing to say hey I don't know everything and then I'll figure it out with you guys and I love a lot of the leadership uh, analogies there too when I meet uh, youngsters today I keep asking them like who are you listening to what are you reading like there's just so much uh, we didn't have that much of an opportunity that you could just google and then you you have access to so many people you could tweet to someone they might actually pond to you there's just a wealth of content out there and i love to meet and hear from people who are uh, happy to expose themselves to all that's out there that's great so as we wrap up uh, shridip your kind of parting words of wisdom if i may because for the young and middle management folks today it's been challenging times no doubt in many ways and many of them are early career looking at take off that didn't really take off or mid career looking at stagnation in some way or the other because industries and business models and everything is being questioned over the last few years how do you draw inspiration on a daily basis like how do you kind of set your foot into the door at work and give it your best words of advice or what thoughts would you have for them The biggest thing that's happening around us is things are changing so fast and it's so difficult to predict exactly how the next 10 years are going to pan out. So the first thing I would tell everybody is to constantly learn. If somebody who is not learning today will be out of business and and this is not something that I know that this is a cliche and probably everybody talks about it but you can't tell that enough. How many ever times you repeat it it's, it's still not enough. You need to constantly learn. You need to constantly as in 5 years ago people didn't know that artificial intelligence is going to we thought okay fine this is done by the geek somewhere and there's no role in our lives and those guys who didn't pay attention then are struggling today because it is even and like you know I'm in a very traditional business dairy industry people think that it's not like probably like you know a very what do you call the futuristic business that people think about but even in our business we have umpteen applications for ai which puts us ahead of the competition so that's just an example i'm i'm, I'm saying that be a constant learner is the first advice i will have for everyone secondly your career is a marathon right in sense like it's a marathon without any end i really like this concept of ikigai right? so it's a very japanese concept and they believe in fact ikigai concept tells you that there is no word for retirement in japanese in japanese there's no word as in can't translate that in japanese because they just don't retire so may your life your career is probably a marathon that you will continue to do for the next i don't know how many 50 60 years or whatever let that not daunt you if somebody is thinking that okay fine if i'm going to be this used to like probably so why you will recall 20 years ago 30 years ago people used to believe people used to think that okay in 30 years time i'm going to be this or whatever whatever this is not relevant anymore in today's world so while you prepare yourself for that marathon which you're going to run for 50 60 years always think of short sprints even when i lead my team i only talk for years and that the purpose the team comes together to deliver on a purpose for 3 years and by some ridiculous people saying <laughs> okay bro, we need vision which runs 100 to 100. but to do that you need to have those purposeful sprints of 3 to 5 years if 3 years is uncomfortable for you make it 5 years but that 5 years should be a purposeful sprint for you and you need to think of moving from level 1 it's like playing a video game or something level 1 to level 2 or something think of it like that so always constantly keep pushing yourself i love that i think today everyone seems to be in such a hurry just remind yourself that you're going to be working for a long time right in some yeah. way or the other may not be the traditional corporate jobs we may all be more in the gig economy we may be sitting out of anywhere all that's fine but you're going to be working for a long time yeah as in like things couldn't have been so different from the past i remember when i used to be in college uh, engineering and all people used to say that i want to retire by 40 Can you even believe that? <laughs> yeah. Like this is such a stupid thing to say in, in today's world. Today I say I wish I never retire. Yeah. So the third thing I, I will talk about is, is build expertise. And people are so superficial. As when I meet a lot of people who actually like when I'm having a conversation, if I ask 
a couple of drill down questions you hit uh, pretty hard uh, rock <laughs> <laughs> yeah that building that domain expertise whatever uh, you're working on has to be and not just in terms of understanding the nuts and bolts of the business that's that's not the only thing i'm talking about but i'm also understanding the essence of the true essence of it like what what can you distill from that which is a learning that you will carry always with you that that's the underlying strength that you will build in you as a leader and this is something that will take you far and the last thing for all of this to work is to i believe this can be practiced to build humility one way i do this is like if i feel comfortable in some place i get out of that place and i, I go to i push myself into a zone of outside my comfort zone where i feel like miserable <laughs> where i know nothing where people make fun of me now there have been many instances where people said that no who is this guy and see you need to constantly keep yourself humble so that's probably one if you don't do that the first three are not going to happen i love how you tied it together and not i think very few people speak of humility as something that uh, you can practice i never thought of it that way i mean you think okay some guys are humble some aren't but you're right it's not really in the traditional way that we see it putting yourself in a tough spot putting yourself in a new spot is a form of humility right to say i don't know and i'm willing to learn and yes. i really like that perspective yes <laughs> you summed it up really well it's been a wonderful conversation shridip i'm i'm so glad we finally found time to have a really really in depth and and very insightful conversation for me got to also know a lot more about you than i did so that's great <laughs> i'm learning too oh sure no no see uh i should thank you i should thank you i i really did not know what to expect and when you ask me all these questions and when i'm answering i'm reflecting and i'm thinking and i'm learning at the same time it's been such a wonderful conversation with you sir thank you see you soon bye see you bye bye Thank you for listening till the very end. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. If you'd like to leave us a note about the episode, please do write in at connect at raincraft.in or drop us a voice message at speakpipe.com slash raincraft. All the details about our guest today and how you can find us on social media are available in the show notes. So please do have a read. And catch you next time.